So yeah, a couple of years ago, I had uh, a client or a potential client who reached out, was over on Vancouver Island in British Columbia on the West Coast. And whenever you're in uh, maritime temperatures, you have very moderate temperatures. So you don't get true winter, you don't get true summer, you get somewhere in between. And he wanted to grow a hascap farm, Lucernia. And uh, if you look at the origin of element, Lucernia is from the Mongolian steppes. Um, it's, you know, it's in China, it's in Mongolia. It needs cold, it needs chill. And uh, they called and we had a good fit call, which is how I intake everyone. And uh, they told me this and I said, sorry, where are you again? Vancouver Island. I said, you know, I, I'm not going to charge you. You don't have to hire me. I'm going to tell you right now, don't do it. Like it's, you don't have the weather to do that. And the frustration in this person was just palpable. Like I called to get something from you as if I'm a vending machine, you press the button and out comes what you ask for. It's like, no, this is a positive negative. I'm going to tell you, this is not a good call and you should go with a number of other species, especially on the coast. It's like 7A, 7B, 8A. It's just, there's so much to grow there. I don't know why somebody would be so tied, but you're totally right. Um, client management, it's a full, full-time occupation. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody here. Um, got uh, seven folks. We got Saron and Christopher and Jacqueline and and uh, awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. So we are going to jump right into Q and A, and I think our first question was from uh, was from Stephen, Steve Nuez, and he's not here yet. So we may switch down to the next one, and we may come back to his question later on. Nice to see everyone's faces. Thanks so much for jumping in this week. Oh, we got a few more. Yeah, very good. Just remember, if you can put them in earlier, that's a huge help for me because I get to um, think about them beforehand or else you get to watch me think about them uh, in situ. So that's fun too. <laughs> All right, let's hit this. Okay, so yeah, welcome everybody to Oregon State University Permaculture Design Course Pro. This is the 2022 winter spring uh, offering. And this I believe is number three. Yeah, office hour number three. So Stephen asked us a question. I'm just going to check again and see if Steve's here yet. Nope. Uh, Kara asked a question. She's not here. So, Anna. Okay, great. We'll go with yours first. You mentioned soil building in your latest feedback. I would like to ask your advice about the best way to do this without worms in a small garden space for a container garden. I don't intend to use any animal products. I, vol I follow a vegan lifestyle. Any tips or resources are welcome. Yeah, okay. So, so basically, you've got a container and you're trying to build soil. Is that right? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so there's a couple ways of doing this. I would say probably lasagna gardening would be your best bet. And you can lasagna garden in, in, a, in a container. And I've got a good handout on that. So I'm just going to pull it up if I can remember how to spell lasagna. Ah, there we go. And I will put this into the chat. And we'll go through how to do that. So lasagna gardening is basically layer gardening. And what you're doing is you're, you're both composting and you're gardening at the same time. So basically you're layering all your materials and anyone can do this in any climate. Uh, this works really well in the tropics. This works really well in polar climes. Uh, it works basically anywhere. And what you do is you're layering your material. So that way it has the ability to increase its uh, decomposition and it has the ability to create what's called bioturbation, which is basically the mixing of the different layers. So uh, it's kind of like lazy person's composting in that you're not doing like a Berkeley 18 day compost, building it, taking the outside, making it the inside, taking the inside, making it the outside. Um, and it works really well. And especially if you, you put in a little bit of a huga culture idea where you do um, woody debris material in the bottom that's already started to decompose. So if you can find a wood chip pile that started to decompose, that can be a great base for container gardening, especially if you're looking at, um, you know, sort of larger scale containers. If you do something like a wicking bed, uh, or if you do something like the global bucket gardener system created by a couple of 15 year olds that used two five gallon buckets, one uh, fitted into the other with the bottom one acting as a water reserve for the, the upper one for growing tomatoes worked really, really well. Um, so I would say, yeah, lasagna gardening would be fantastic for you first and foremost. Um, if you wanted to start composting as well, 
you know, that's a great opportunity. Um, other ways to build soil. I, I am a huge fan of horse manure. Um, you have to watch out with horse manure because uh, horses are usually dewormed in the raising of them. Um, even the most alternative, um, uh, my partner was uh, bear, uh, bear, what, how does he say that? Bear horse hoof capsule trainers. So uh, they would take off the nail to take care of skeletal musculature issues. And so we have a couple of horses, even we use dewormer because um, the artemisias and the walnuts don't, and the juglones don't necessarily hit all of the, the pests. And once a pest takes root, the, the treatment of that is so much more. So what I would suggest is if you can get a hold of horse manure, make sure to watch it for a year. Um, and after a year of, we, we usually call it aged horse manure. It is one of the best, um, one of the best soil creation processes I've ever used. It just, it creates an incredible amount of, um, of biodiversity and, uh, people like to make, or <laughs> people like to be angry at me because I'll post a hey, year one garden and I've built my soil for a year and a half beforehand. And it's just explosive. So it's, it's a bit of a cheat to build your soil uh, out front. And we do, we do the same thing with trees. So this is a good idea for anybody who's working or thinking about building a tree system. Um, you can prep a hole a year in advance. So you can do like a lasagna garden, hygge culture in a hole, mound it, because you, you lose about 40% over a year of decomposition. Um, and we'll do this in a number of areas, especially on the coast. We used to do this with, um, with material where we would prep uh, a tree hole the year before and then the year after we'd be ready for it and we'd plant into it because all that material would become just a repository of uh, nutrition does that help yeah i have a follow-up question yeah uh, i don't intend to use any horse manure <laughs> i don't because i don't want to use any animal products like anything that comes from animals but I looked it up uh, and there are some some things that you can buy online to make compost and it's just like because you turn it, but the small ones are very expensive and I thought is there some way to do this uh, like in a homemade version of it like is there a, because I thought it was just like because you were turning something so let's say if you get something that has a lead and it's not too big. Is that possible to do that? Or no, it doesn't exist. Yeah, you definitely can. Um, you know, at some level, uh, there's, there's the biological processes that happen to create soil, which, which involve microorganisms. So they involve fungi, bacteria, microarthropods, protozoa, and nematodes. You know, all of those uh, microflora will be and fauna will be working to create that soil. Um, it's it's an inherent piece of creating soil that you have these microorganisms that eat different elements, and in their um, in their life cycles, they are predated upon by higher trophic levels within the microorganism, the soil food web, and then that material that they ate is then bioavailable for plants and for creation of soil. So uh, you, you can't get away from building soil without involving some kind of uh, fauna. I, I guess it would depend on at what level or, you know, where that classification lands for you because uh, it, it- No, bacteria, bacteria is fine uh, because they are natural in the yeah, they are everywhere, right? And I just didn't want to get an animal, uh, like for example, worm, and put inside of a container. And I feel like, right? Sure, sure. So no, I'm responsible for that worm because the worm is not on the earth anymore. <laughs> so I, I, I don't want to get an animal and put it here just to help me with this. If the bacteria comes naturally and weird great it's not like what i what i meant but it's just like because i saw these uh it's some some type of uh, containers that you put uh, uh, the these food scraps and then you turn it and maybe after two weeks 
he would have the compost, but some are very expensive. I saw one that was like super expensive. And I was like, no, it was just like turning something. Is, is there a way to do that and don't need to buy these expensive things? But yeah. if you don't know them, it, it's fine. Yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of things there. So it sounds like the limit for you is, is macro fauna that you can see or things you have to be responsible for, things that you're bringing in from someplace else and putting into, but if they come with material that you're composting, that's okay. Um, so yeah, you can you can do the, the, the same work as a, I think they're called countertop, countertop composters that have a, some kind of agitator or, or spinner in them. Um, all the data I've seen off of those is that the, the soil created, the compost that created doesn't usually have a high level of, um, populations or diversity in it. Uh, so any of the scientific studies I've seen on them haven't proven to be uh, wildly beneficial. You could do the same thing with what's called a Bokashi composter, which Bokashi is um, an anaerobic way of creating um, a type of soil amendment. So it's a, a, a great way to, to take material and to decompose it. Um, tons of really good books on that. And you can buy the starter online and you can get into it for 20 or 30 bucks. You could also just take on the work of spinning it, right? You could, you could take a five gallon bucket, make sure that there's some air holes in it. So you'd have to, to drill it a bit. And then as you put in material in there, this is something that a colleague of mine did for years. Um, they would put all of their compost scraps into a blender. They would blend it and put it into a bucket that would slowly decompose into, um, into soil. So you could take on that bioturbation by mixing it up and turning it up in a, in a blender or something like that. Um, it's an extra step, um, but mostly when we talk about compost, we're talking about a minimum of a meter cubed. So we're talking a meter by a meter by a meter. And there's a reason for that. It's because of the heat that has to come up for compost to go through what's called the thermophilic and the mesophilic stages. So thermophilic is high heat, and it's one of the reasons why we why we use 58 degrees Celsius as being the turn point for compost. You never want it to crest 60 because if it crests 60, then all of a sudden you have the microorganisms that are within it that are starting to die off. You'll see it in graphs and basically you hit 60 and you get this sort of sinusoidal wave, this distribution that will move past. Um, so yeah, I would say you could take it all on yourself and you could do that mixing and do that blending and then put it into a, a bucket or something within your... Um, like underneath your sink and just make sure that there's um, paper, um, uh, shredded paper on top or wood chips on top. So that way the smell, because as that's decomposing, there is going to be a smell. So you'll have to balance the nitrogen to the carbon. And normally what comes out of our kitchen is high nitrogen. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, the compost on the, on the, uh, the, the counter smells is that it just has so much nitrogen and it's not balanced well with carbon. So what I would say is if you do that, make sure you have a good source of carbon. So shredded newspapers, leaves, um, cardboard that's ripped up that doesn't, that isn't glossy because um, glossy cardboard has issues with decomposing. Uh, or you could just go with a straight Bokashi. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Uh, second question, I'm considering using fabric containers because they're lightweight and would be easy to transport in case of moving. Are there permaculture practices related to this type of container? If not, what would be a good solution? Yeah, so fabric roll bags. I've got a colleague who only grows tomatoes in fabric grow bags, and um, it's hard to argue with his results. So fabric grow bags are long bags that you can roll down the sides of, and you can start with a little bit of soil, put your seed in, and especially tomatoes, which root off of the stem, they basically keep bearing up to the leaves. And what happens is it all roots out. And so when they do go and plant that tomato, it has you know, an eight week head start of root growth. You may only see a couple of leaves at the top because they're consistently bearing everything, but it's an explosive amount of growth. And actually that's what I'm doing this year. I've, I've just started, a, <laughs> even though there's a, a solid two feet of snow outside of me, I've I've started the, the gardening season already this year. Um, so fabric containers are great. The problem is, is that they don't hold a lot of rigidity. So if you have them and you're working with them and all the rest of it, they can, they can be difficult to move and difficult to work with. So with my containers, the containers I know that I may have to move, I'm using mostly with nursery stock pots. So 
a one, a four, a five, you know, all of these gallon pots. Um, and I would probably work with those, especially if you're financially conscious, because they're cheap to find, easy to use. If you double them up, they're hard to break. Um, and you'll usually find nurseries that are getting rid of them. So it's easy to find. Um, in my situation, I had to purchase a bunch, but they were secondhand from a nursery. Uh, and that works pretty well. I, I would probably go that direction. Does that answer your question? Oh, frozen. <laughs> All right, well, we'll wait to see if she comes back. And great, I'm just gonna check the chat here. Uh, the monks built an in-ground vermicomposting system in their place, that's great, thanks, Kara. Kara, sorry, Bakashi is wonderful. Yeah, very sweet smell. And uh, they need a lot of water. Okay, awesome. So I don't think Steve's here yet. So I think we'll go back up to Kara's question. My entire design site is still under snow, which makes it difficult to identify plant species. Uh-huh, at this time, uh, things will start to thaw out mid-March. Knowing the ecology of this area, is it okay to just take a guess at what might be under the snow? Would not be able to indicate specific locations in microclimates, but at least I'd still have something on the slide. Yeah, totally. So great question. Um, yeah, we have to be a little bit conscientious of snow uh, at this point and uh, things like our soil assignment and um, our plant uh, assessment assignment. I would say absolutely, you know, uh, make your best guess, indicate um, uh, site visit for this time was in winter conditions cannot see ground. Um, if you can take a stab at, you know, start to take a stab at going and identifying trees without leaves. It's a fun, it's a fun opportunity to really um, push your identification skills and start to take a look at branching patterns. You know, when you take a look at, so when you find things like this, which are plant ID guides for, in Canada, we have the lone pine tree in the States. Most of them are the audible, um, the audible guides or not audible, Audubon. Um, but inside of these books, you'll have what's called a dichotomous key. And that die key used for short, um, that dichotomous key will help you to delineate what you're looking at. And especially if you have a tree one, and that can be a, that can be a fun way of going out and trying to identify either by early buds or by branching pattern or by bark color and coloration and texture, uh, by location, it can be a nice hunt to say, well, it could be one, two, three, or four of these that might, it might be. And then you can confirm that in the spring. The reason why we do this and why it's important is that we have to build competency and identification. It's something that uh, working with uh, indigenous folks, be they Kenyans or Ugandans or Cubans or First Nations, it's amazing how much they can identify around them. And we have a very low ecological literacy. And so one of the, the pieces that I find is absolutely necessary is to build a, a classification and an ID knowledge within ourselves. And I was poor, am poor at it. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to have just a passing familiarity. And you start with, with kid ID. Um, there's another great book, which I highly recommend called Bought Me in a Day by Thomas Alpel. Let's see if it'll pop out at me. Where are you, Alpel? Um, it's one of my favorite books to start anybody off of because it's really, uh, it's really situated to a full-time beginner. Um, Bought Me in a Day really goes through the step-by-step -step points about just starting to understand that, oh, interesting, all mint has square stems and it has opposite leaves instead of alternating leaves and so whenever you're out in the wild and you're you know you're looking at the ground it's like oh interesting this is part of the mint family i know this because i've got this one id piece or when we used to do programs i used to work for the alberta parks department as a natural interpreter these are people who uh will follow you around <laughs> with uh uh with a cougar skull being like hey do you want to learn about a cougar it's a fun job um but when, when we were out there, you learned really simple processes like, oh, interesting, uh, spruce are sharp and square and fir are flat and friendly. You know, there's these little simple mnemonics, especially for kids, 
which works great for my brain, which you come up and you start to, you know, you grab, you shake hands with a tree. And if the tree pokes you, you know, it's probably spruce if it's a short needle tree. So things like that can really help out. But uh, I would say just indicate it on the slide. Let us know. Hey, I, I, th these are good guesses, but I don't completely know. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just I'll just show, uh, make it clear what I do know and what I don't. Fantastic. And that that goes for the all assignments. You know, if there's something that the assignment asks for, you're like, I don't know that or I have to go research that still. That's totally fine. We just want to you have to show your work. So I know that you went through the process as we were talking about before everyone jumped on um, my work as an instructor is to make sure the rubric is taken care of and that you go through the process. But myself as a designer and, and as um, you know, so much of this work is intention based and values based for me, it's it's life work for me. So I really want you folks to go as far and as quickly as you can, because um, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of in a place right now where we need all of you being incredibly uh, active as I think all you would like to be. So uh, awesome. Any any follow ups to that, uh, Cara, or does that complete it? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. All right, going on to Stephen's question. Stephen is not here. So Stephen, I'm going to make a number of assumptions. I was hoping you would jump on. Um, but uh, that's okay. So Stephen has a couple of questions. And we're just gonna come back here. I'm gonna check the chat. Okay, cool. <clears throat> I want to clarify something from my most recent assignment. I have a pool that's pretty old. I think the previous owners put it in 2005. Can I use pool water to water plants? They're treated with chlorine, but I know it could off gas after some time. When we get a heavy rain, we wind up dumping a lot of it. Why not use it? Old pool burst. While we hope we're on top of maintenance, who knows? What's the best way to surface a burst of chlorinated water on my carrots on a design? To surface a burst of chlorinated water. I'm not sure what that means. Do any ways of mitigating this come to mind? Pathways away from the garden. Okay, Stephen, I understand your first question. Your second question, I'm confused. I'm going to go to your assignment and maybe this is going to give me a bit of info. And we're going to go back up to your base map so I can get a sense of context. And this is one of the reasons why we go through so much design conversation for context. Pooling with heavy water. I guess this must be the pool. Yeah. Okay. So this is the pool. So Stephen's question in essence is, can I use chlorinated pool water to water my plants? So let's go big patterns to details. Let's talk about concepts before we get into specifics and context. Um, so big pattern, uh, what's chlorine? Chlorine is a biocide. Chlorine is used to quote unquote, make our water drinkable. Um, it's usually used in a percentage for the amount of volume that's used. And it's used so that way nothing will grow in our water uh, before it gets to us for both positive and negative detriments. Because for millennia, we drank living water. Uh, water was supposed to be living. Water was supposed to have elements and, and microorganisms in it that helped to repopulate our gut, our gut flora and really produce a huge amount of vitality within us. We're one-tenth human, we're nine-tenths other. You take a look at every single uh, organism within our body or every single cell even, uh, nine-tenths of our cells are not human. They are other types of bacteria and fungi and organisms that live inside of us. And when we eat, we're actually feeding a, a trillion member community. And one of the reasons or one of the ways that we support them is by drinking living water and eating living food. When that food is denatured, denuded, irradiated as so much food is when it crosses the border, it is not living. When we drink chlorinated water, it's the same thing like drinking alcohol. I'm very sorry for those of you that like your drink. Um, it is a biocide. It, it does wipe out populations within our stomach. And our stomach is a second brain to our bodies. And so when we wipe out those populations, they take time to come back. It's one of the reasons why we usually don't feel so well after, uh, after drinks, after alcohol. Um, and so when we talk about chlorine, and this is one of the reasons why if you ever create aerated compost extracts or teas, this is where we take compost, we put it in a stiff but permeable bag, we put it into water, and then we use what's called a diaphragmatic pump, which pumps air, not water, pumps air through a volume of water and basically agitates the compost in the compost bag and then removes the microorganisms into the water. And then we apply that water now called um, 
uh, liquid biological amendment or aerated compost extract or tea onto our soil to introduce microorganisms to soil. This is a wonderful way to build soil. When we do that, one of the major recommendations is we do not use chlorinated or chloramated water because there's chlorine and chloramides that come into our water, usually at a domestic level. The thing about chlorine is chlorine can off gas. Usually with a small volume of water, you can off gas chlorine within 24 or 48 hours. So when I lived in cities that had chlorination, I would usually take the water off the tap and set it aside and let it off gas for 24 to 48 hours before drinking it or before putting it through filtration. Now, some filters can take care of that. Uh, you've got um, high, um, or pardon me, low micron filter carbon filters or ceramic filters that can take it out. When it gets to chloramides, um, they are a little bit more difficult to remove. They take either vitamin C or colloidal silver from a filter process and they do not off gas. So first and foremost, Stephen, make sure you know what kind of uh, chlorine products going into your pool. And secondly, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use that water for um, watering uh, only because it is um, potentially highly detrimental. Uh, I would imagine if you had that full volume of water and you left it for three or four days, not adding any other chlorine and tested it to see if there was any chlorine in it and there wasn't, fine, let's use it. But generally, if we are going to be growing food and we want that food and the microorganisms within that soil to be highly prolific and um, having a good time, so to speak, uh, we don't necessarily want to, uh, to put that into scope. Uh, the other thing here, Stephen, now that I've, I've got your assignment here, and I'm pretty sure I gave you this feedback before, you want to integrate your contours into your map. So that would mean turning this uh, slightly opaque, putting this over top, and then tracing these out and then making sure that you label these contours off the side. Now, I've probably said this before, but I'll say it again. Remember that any online contour map generator, paid or unpaid, is going to come from the shuttle radar topographic mission that happened in 2000 from NASA. They went up in the shuttle and they shot LIDAR, which is laser image detecting and ranging, which they shot a laser down to the planet, came back up and they got um, good data on the planet, but every pixel that they shot was 30 meter pixel, which means if you have a uh, sub 30 meter elevation difference, which all of us have, it did the very scientific process of guessing interpolation, what was underneath that to the point to where that data can be 15 meters in error on the X axis. So you could be wildly off. And I did a survey of a client of mine last year because they were using that data. They were using a paid contour map generator online and uh, their contours that were produced by that map were perpendicular to the contours they knew were on the landscape because they walked the landscape, right? You have to ground truth any data you get from the internet. And so we ended up going and doing a, what's called a hybrid survey. So we created ground control points. These were visible ground control points you could see from a drone. And then we rented an RTK base station. RTK stands for real-time kinetic, which means it's actively always in real-time connecting with satellites and it connects with all the different satellite, um, satellite uh, constellations. And then we had what's called a range or a receiver. And I walked around taking points underneath the canopy and everything that was in open canopy, we ran a drone. It was a DGI Mavic, Mavic, just the original, I think. Basically, it went over the property with a third party um, application called Drone Deploy. And basically, through photogrammetry, which is using uh, trigonometry and understanding about where it is in relative position to the landscape, it can create a eight centimeter accurate, up to eight centimeter accuracy for open canopy. Once you get to closed canopy, the only thing the drone is seeing is the tops of the trees. So that's why we took the RTK base station and walk through the trees. I then sent it to a GIS specialist to process and they had an amazing algorithm that when I gave them data about the tree stand, so height, type of species, average diameter and average spacing to each tree, they were able then to subtract that height with the ground control points and the points in the trees to make a very accurate um, map to the point to where uh, the client is, is a pretty popular YouTuber 
And they made an amazing video that showed that the one little line that comes on the, the road was exactly where the water was flowing. So um, just make sure to be aware of where your data comes from. Old purse bursts, old pools burst. Hope we, well, we hope we're on top of maintenance, who knows? I guess what he might be saying is what's the best way if the pool bursts and put it into, what would be the best way of mitigating a burst pool? I'm not sure, Stephen. Like the glib part of me wants to say, keep sharp things away from it. Uh, but I, again, I'm really guessing on what you're asking here. Pathways away from the garden. Yeah, you're gonna have to give me a bit more context here, Stephen, for me to answer that one. I mentioned I was concerned about making bad earthworks that would make that would be hard to back out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Happy to happy to talk about that. So, let's talk earthworks for a second. So, um, all of you are starting off. All of you are 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 beginning your work in this work. And so, when we talk about development, when we talk about experiments, one of the things that we want to be aware of is starting small. And this is a wonderful concept that comes to us uh, from a number of folks. David Holmgren talked about it in his 12 principles in his first book, Small and Slow Solutions. Um, Sepp Holter talks about it by saying, start with a small nucleated design and work out from there. Brad Lancaster talks about this by saying, you know, start up in the headlands and the, in the watershed, start with rills and runnels. These are small flows like uh, flows of water that are the size of your finger start there. Don't start at the Mississippi because if you mess up at the Mississippi, there'll be a large amount of life land that will be destroyed, both um, human and uh, local ecology and animals and flora. So start small, first and foremost. The first pond I ever made was about the size of, you know, about two feet across. And I, I built it in miniature with the soil that I was using that was stratified in the way that it was stratified on the landscape. And this is something that Sepp Holzer still does to this day. Um, so start small. Um, if you're gonna make a swale, start with a small swale that's you know, a foot high berm and a, and, a, and, a, and a foot trough and watch how it works. Watch when if you don't make a swale that's perfectly on contour, it now is a drainage ditch and all the water flows one way. Watch if you do not create overflow for that swale by creating a level sill spillway, then eventually, if the water comes out the sides of that swale, it will erode that swale to the point to where the swale is no longer there. Start very small. Make small, slow, incremental steps to avoid excremental results. We go slowly so we don't end up with a huge pile of issue. When we're talking about earthworks, when we work with earthworks, and this, I, I'm pretty sure this was one of the things that he was commenting on, he was talking about the expense of buying machine. I will say this once. I will hopefully, this will be etched into stone. Do not buy an earthworks machine. Do not buy an earthworks machine. Why? Well, in almost all situations, do not buy machinery. Why would I say such a thing? So I had the pleasure of working with a mentor for a number of years, Michael Nichols of Seven Ravens Permaculture Academy and Farm on Salt Spring Island. Um, Michael is a forester and he makes an incredible amount of material off of his forest and he prunes his forest and he works his forest. And up until a few years ago, Michael owned zero pieces of heavy machinery. He owned a couple of chainsaws and generally he hired in the mechanization he needed. Why did he do that? Uh, well, me being a precocious young learner, uh, not really believing anything I was being told, I ran the numbers and did an entire spreadsheet of running the numbers of what was the cost of him renting versus the cost of owning, depreciation, maintenance. Um, and then there's a, a, a small percentage of potential catastrophic failure and then insurance. It's almost one to 10 in terms of what you save. You, you, you save, you know, you save a hundred to a thousand dollars by just renting. Not to mention, unless you're going to go into this as a profession, the time you spend on that machine is going to be, again, about 10x to do the same work as a professional. So a professional comes in, knows how, to, knows how to dig, knows how to build, knows how to work, and it's about one in 10. Every once in a while, and this is saying something, every once in a while when I find a good trade or a good rental or a good deal or a good neighbor, yeah, I will pay for a week long of machine time and I will hone my skills knowing that there's payment for honing your skills and it's in the work. 
it's that you're not developing really high quality work. And I've got, I've got a number of hours on machine now, so I'm, I'm not terrible, but it takes a lot of time and energy. And so, especially when you start off and especially when you're making high level, high impact, high risk earthworks, I would not bring, I would not purchase machinery for that. Uh, it may be double duty or stacked function machinery. Like we already need something to plow the road or we know we need to mow. And so you buy something like a Kubota, which is a multi-use tool. It may have a PTO, which is called a power takeoff, which allows you to run other implements off the back of it. Um, it may have a small backhoe. It may have a lifter in the front. Okay, I get that. But at the same time, know that you're now paying for the maintenance, the upkeep, all the rest of that. And so without fail, I've advised the majority, if not all of my clients over the last, you know, since 2009 to not purchase equipment. In terms of making bad decisions, never build something that you haven't already built with a shovel. Start with a shovel, start with a pick, start with a hoe. Do not make your first earthwork with a machine. There's a couple of reasons for that. The mistakes you make are big and the mistakes you make already exist. So this is something I learned years ago. The mistakes that are in front of us already exist before we make them because we don't know. There's actually no way of knowing until we get there. So the mistakes around, what's something new I'm learning right now? I'm learning a new computer program. And the mistakes I'm making already exist because I don't know those things. I haven't learned them yet. So the mistakes that you're going to make on the earthworks already exist. So go make those mistakes at the shovel level. Go make those mistakes with a shovel and a rake that you know you can come back from and you're not out the cost of the rental or the purchase of the machine and then potentially what might happen because of it. Last year, two years ago, <clears throat> I made a very large um, huga culture. Huga culture is buried wood. Over time, it decomposes, becomes a wonderful re uh, a coral reef, so to speak, for water and organisms and all the rest of it. I made it off of my shop. So if I, if I draw this out for you, and I'm sure I have photos someplace, but it'll be easier to draw. So we'll get into this a lot more in our design work, but if you do not feed things like swales, and if you do not feed things like huga culture, they won't hold any extra water potentially. So let's do this, make sure I've got my line, cool. So here's my shop, we'll do it in perspective. So probably look a little wonky, but not terrible. That's about the size of it. So here's my shop and on average, you'll get to this during the watershed assignment. This shop produces about um, 30,000 liters of water per side. So up here, about 30,000 liters of water. So I know that hookah culture works really, really well if you feed it. So what I did is I made a big, excuse me, I made a big E. So I made a big E, a big trench along the drip line of the edge of this, and then along the tines. So I made hookah culture tines. And so these were uh, trenches that were about a meter and a half wide by about a meter half to two meters deep. And I had a whole bunch of rotten wood around here that we had cut down due to fire suppression and risk management. And so I layered all that wood inside of this big E. So all of this wood got layered into this big E. This was all done by machine. The machine cost about $600 to bring in and do this. So there's all this wood now in there. And so in, in um, cross section, so let's say we do a cross section here and this will give you a sense about what the cross section looks like when we do it. Uh, so if we did, let's say a cross section like this, call this A to A, we'll do this down here. And we'll do this exactly how we would do it in the class. So this would be A and this would be A apostrophe. And we also have to label it down here, A, A apostrophe. Here we go. So what this looks like in the ground, let's make sure my drawing tool's on, great. So what this looks like in the ground is we've got uh, two, two by two, two by two, two by two. And then inside we have wood, lots and lots of wood. And while that would be very fun to draw every single one of those, we're gonna make this a little quicker. So uh, let's make it solid. So we have all this wood, all this decomposing wood. And the reason we use decomposing wood is because um, 
Puga culture works best when the wood is already decomposing. And because bark have biocides and fungicides in it, you want it to decompose before you put it in. And there are some wood we don't use unless it's decomposing, things like cedar, things like juniper, things like black locust, anything that resists decomposition is usually used as a fence post or has volatile acids we don't use. And then at the end of this, I ended up piling up all that amazing horse manure I was telling you folks about that was already on the land and all I had to do was hire somebody to windrow it with a machine, like so. Cool. So up top here, we have all of these big mounds. Now you'll notice as I'm doing this, I'm not showing that the side of this um, E was covered. It wasn't. I just left it as a drip edge and I left it with soil on top. So that way it could just have the water coming off of the roof could just come down and basically wet this entire bed. So when I did this, I thought I might've made a big mistake. I'm, I thought I might've spent $600 to do nothing. In year one, hookah cultures don't do a lot. So I left it. In year two, what I did is I, I put a big black tarp over all of this. So it's called silage tarp. It comes in three, six, nine, 12 millimeter, black on one side, white on the other. So basically I covered this whole thing with a big tarp during the early growing season. I covered bed one, two, and three with a tarp from this side, put a bunch of weights down on it and left it. This is called stale seed bed technique. And what it does is early in the season when everything's coming up and that wonderful genetic seed bank that's in the soil, that includes what people commonly called weeds, which is really just plant racism. It's saying, I don't like the plant because it does a thing I don't like, but it's just a plant, it just has a functionality. But if you're growing, those plants that are in the soil in the genetic bank can compete with what you wanna grow. So I threw an entire tarp on it. And because the other, I have a number of gardens, because the other gardens were taking precedent, I didn't get to this to about June. So it was kind of late in the season. I pulled back the tarp from two and three, left the tarp on one, planted out all my squash there, planted out a number of flowers, planted out some tomatoes, some sunflowers, watered in the transplants and walked away from it. During the heat dome, we got to 52 and 53 degrees Celsius up here. Uh, for those of you that are in Fahrenheit, I highly recommend you see what that comes out to. And still didn't water this bed. This bed produced all of my squash, the squash that's actually right behind my desk for the entire season with zero watering. Two main distinctions to make. Huga culture by itself normally isn't self-watering. You have to feed it water. Notice I said that a number of times. So basically I took that 30,000 liters of water instead of putting it into storage, which I could still do and overflow that storage. So if I wanted to, I could still do that. I could still overflow this storage. So if I wanted, I could put a cistern on the side here. Oh, I should do it in perspective because that's what I've been doing thus far. Black, smaller line. I could still, listen, if I switch it to a, there we go. I could still do a little cistern here, do a, a slim line or something. And I could still hold five, 10,000 liters of water. Totally could still do that. But, you know, I, what I would do is I would take a gutter off of this and make sure that the gutter can take the volume and then have that come down to a first flush diverter and then come into my tank. And then my overflow, I would then put back into the system again. Right, Because any water holding capacity we have is literally a drop in the bucket. You will be amazed at the amount of water you can hold, you can um, catch off of a surface. One meter by one meter squared by one millimeter of rain is a liter of water. So this is a liter and a half. But when you think about the total amount of water that's coming off of your surfaces, it's remarkable. So I could have still done that and I might still, but I wanted this water to go directly into the ground. Why? Because the ground has the highest water storing capacity possible. Every percent of organic matter increased on an acre is roughly 20,000 gallons of water storage. Every percent, 1% of organic matter that you increase on an acre is 20,000 gallons of water storage. Um, 20,000 gallons is 80,000 liters. 
usually when you're installing a cistern, a liter of water in a cistern is about a dollar of total installed costs. So if you have a 10,000 10, liter cistern, it's about $10,000. But what does it cost to do, put in a cover crop? What does it cost to put in a hookah culture? For this situation, it was about 600 bucks. And now this bed, and I've got some great winter photos that I'll be posting on Instagram at Javan uh, Kirby, J-A-V-A-N-K-E-R-B-Y, if you want to follow. Um, I love watching all the snow slide off of this and slide onto my bed. Why? Because my bed's being watered all winter long. It's just being watered. I'm watching the snow slide off of it. I'm watching it being watered. I will do the exact same thing with the tarp this year. I'll put the tarp over top. I'll let it be hopefully for less time. Hopefully I'm more on the ball. Uh, when you grow, when you're trying to grow about 80 to 90% of your own food, there's a lot of things going in. And I'm, I'm the person who does about 95% of the work. So it takes a lot of time. So this is a great example of how to A, capture rainwater, B, put it in the ground, C, use hookah culture, and four, create a system that is a flywheel. It's a regenerative ruin. So if I walk away from this tomorrow, this will produce plants forever, right? It's a metal building. It's a metal structure. It's a metal roof. There's some holes in it for sure, <laughs> but it's a regenerative ruin. This is something that will leave the place better and a couple of years some ponderosa pine seedlings will find it and there'll be more ponderosa pine there and they'll probably be faster growing than all the rest of it than everything else um so to ask your question steven uh i wouldn't buy machinery i happily talk you out of it i would build small scale earthworks first and foremost make sure that you're ready to plant those earthworks especially if they're things like swales or dams you want to plant them right away you have a very short opportunity to play uh, deity here and to say, this is what I want to go here. And if you don't, Mother Nature will be like, I got this. I got this seed bank here. I'll put it what I need into it. So just be aware that you'll need to be have that ready to go. So that way you're moving forward. Now, before I move off of this diagram, I'm just going to check the chat to see if there's alternative questions that are coming up here. Uh, Crystal, okay. Okay, so we had a question about compost extract. So I'll Get to that in a second, Zach. Crystal, how well did it grow last year? It produced all of my squash, um, some nice sunflowers. The flowers died out. They, they, they just needed more time to establish. Um, this year I will do squash again. Uh, and I will remember things that I forgot that some squash cross because they're too close. So now I'm gonna have my different families in different areas. It was one of those things that I was running out the door and I was planting and I wasn't thinking. Um, so remember that some squash crosses and you don't want to have zucchinis and things like that, where you get weird, weird zucchini crosses that nobody wants to eat and end up becoming worm food, which is fine. Um, but yeah, it worked phenomenally and every year it works better and better and better. So, you know, last year it produced all the squash this year, it'll produce all the squash and probably all the sunflowers and probably this new black hollyhock I've got coming, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and then we'll probably do the exact same process off the back of the house and use um, big O piping to move the water through the hookah culture. Any other questions about that process? I just posted it in the chat, but may, maybe you missed it. I was just wondering, what, what's the reason to put the tarp on it? Did you put it on over winter for the freezing or why tarp the hugo culture? culture? Yeah, so that process is called stale seed bed tarping. And the reason we do it is we put it over the bed after the snow is melted because we want all of that snow to melt into the bed. Uh, so we put it on afterwards. And what it does is as the new growth that is in the genetic seed bank of the soil grows up, and it's usually the undesirables we don't want mm. um, that would compete with the plants that we do, what we're doing is we're exhausting that, that seed supply. So basically it grows up, dies out, grows up, dies out, grows up, dies out. And we put the black on top so that we were adding more thermal value to that soil in the early spring. So it wakes up the soil food web early um, because the, the major limiting factor for me and my climate is north of the 49th parallel in North America and Canada is wind. So the chill effect of wind chill and the temperature of the soil. Because it gets so cold here for so long, we have to wait until like, end of June, July for the soil temperature to really warm up, which is when the soil organisms warm up. So two techniques that help with that is uh, stale seed bed. And the other is a technique I learned from a mentor of mine who 
created an amazing food forest called Dragon's Eye Food Forest, which is now called Phil Belly uh, in Grand Forks, British Columbia, three acres of bare horse pasture that over 25 years became a seven story food forest as, as all the examples show, it was a gorgeous place. Um, took care of a family of four, completely supplied two businesses. One was a, a nursery business and apothecary business. And he was trying to grow nuts. He was grow, trying to grow bark nut, butternut, walnut, uh, xanthoceres, you name it. And the Nut Growers Association of Wisconsin uh, was saying, hey, you can grow these in three years and four years and five years. All, all these fruiting uh, times that he was just like, I'm not getting that. So finally, seven years after he created a relationship with these guys, he, 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 he wrote them a letter, as you did back then said, listen, I'm not getting these results. There's something else I'm missing. And they said, well, you've proven yourself to be a, a worthy to be valid because so many of these gentlemen are like that and, and women, truthfully. Um, they really want to see the people showing up and, and really dedicating themselves to the work before they give away all their secrets. And they said, we'll tell you what we do. So they, they take a piece of plywood, four by eight foot sheet of plywood. They take like a thousand feet of poly um, hose, could be like, half inch or three inch or quarter inch, doesn't matter. And basically they wrap it on to this piece of plywood and they use whatever they have, staples, wire, to basically hold it on there. So now you've got a thousand feet of poly that's onto this four by eight sheet of plywood. And then you put two valves, one on the, the, the inlet and one on the outlet. And you make sure your fittings can work for whatever your irrigation system is, be it garden hose or whatever. And what happens is when you leave that in the sun, it warms up. And what they were doing is after the last frost of winter, notice I said after the last frost of winter, because you don't want to warm up water and then have it freeze again, because you'll activate the tree to go into bud. And if it freezes, it can be catastrophic for that tree for that year. After the last frost, they would water their trees with warm water and it would wake up the soil biology. And all of a sudden, uh, my colleague and mentor, was getting the same fruiting times. It basically extended the growing season without having to do any sort of above ground greenhouses. They were basically manipulating soil temperature to manipulate um, the, uh, the soil food web to bring it up. Now you can do this later in the fall, but it's dangerous because you may get yourself into an early frost and that's problematic. So generally I only do this in spring. You can do it in fall, but unless you're really pushing a tree, it's just not necessary. So that's the stale seed bed technique, black tarp on top, white, white on bottom. If I got into the middle of the season and it was too warm, I would do the white on top, the black on bottom. And it's to ensure that the genetic bank that's in the soil comes up, dies out, comes up, dies out, comes up, dies out. So that way that seed bed is quote unquote stale. So that way you get to choose, you get to be the deity and choose what goes in there. Does that make sense, Chris? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a very common practice in market gardening. So it's done a lot in market gardening in that way. Cool, I'm gonna check back to, oh, any other questions before this, before I uh, delete this most beautiful, amazing diagram that I drew with my mouse. I just wanna make sure everyone knows I did that with my mouse, pretty good. Any other questions, comments, queries? Thanks for the giggles. I appreciate it. It is the comedy hour. Okay, great. Uh, no questions. All right. Uh, so clear, clear drawings. Go back to question, Q&A. Anybody else? Zach. In my feedback, you said building the CEC of the soil is very important to build soil and to do this through aerated compost teas and extracts. How do teas increase the CEC? Great question. So uh, there is two acronyms that you'll hear me use a lot. And I believe there's content about this in the course. Um, water holding capacity, WHC, and cation exchange capacity. Cation expelled, cation exchange capacity. So when it comes to soil, there's two major things we want to build, CEC and WHC. WHC is water holding capacity. CEC is cation exchange capacity. What's nice is most of our efforts do both of these things through different methods. So when we're dealing with low nutrition soil or uh, monolithic texture, texture is made up of sand, silt, or clay. Clay is the smallest particle, silt is bigger, sand is biggest. 
I want you to use this as your mental, as your, your mental palace or your mental way of looking at this. Think of an entire uh, filing cabinet as sand in terms of its volume. And so let's say it's a two drawer. And let's say if it's a two drawer, I can draw this. I don't have to explain it to you folks in the way that will be problematic. So let's say it's two drawer and it's the same size. So that's roughly right. So anybody forecast how many units of this square surface area is in this one filing cabinet? I can count it out, but does anybody want to take a guess? What's the surface area using this as one? <coughs> Any guess? It's not a quiz, don't be graded. Just doing a little counting. See if anybody's answered on the chat. 10, well done, Zach, yeah. 10 units of surface area. Lots of volume, not a lot of surface area. This is sand, okay? So consider this our sand. This is our sand, so this is sand. Oop, I tell all of you not to do poor contrast in your assignments. Look at me doing yellow on white. This is sand. Inside this file cabinet is a file folder. And for the sake of argument, we're gonna make the file folder the same size as our file cabinet. So we've got a little file folder here. Now a file folder opens. And so a file folder has how many sides to it? One, two, three, four. And let's say for the sake of argument, we could have a hundred of these in a drawer. So it's four per file folder, a hundred per 400 in terms of surface area and the bottom would be 400 as well. So sand is 10 in terms of its surface area. Oh, still on the line, that's fine. I'll just do it that way. And our file folder, which is our silt is 400 in terms of surface area. So this is total surface area. Does anybody know where I'm going with this? What's inside the file folder? Clay. Clay has two sides. It has a positive charge side and a negative charge side, silicon and alum. And clay has a very high CEC, can hold on to a lot of. Let's say we've got, I don't know, 10 of those in each. So 10 times 400 is 4,000. So our, oh, well, that's smart. There we go. 4,000. Oh, wait a second. Did I do that wrong? I think I did that wrong. Wait a second. One, two, 10 per is 20. 20 times 400. Oh, no, is, uh, is uh, 800. Is that right? Am I doing this math right? 8,000? Let me do this again. One, two, and 10 is 20. 20 by that, yeah, 8,000. 8,000 surface areas. So sand is massive, big volume, not a lot of surface area. Silt is smaller, more surface area, still volume. Clay is little tiny plates and has a lot of surface area for the volume it holds. So when we get to CEC, sand has not zero, but almost zero in terms of cation exchange capacity. And cation exchange capacity is the ability for something to hold on to the electrons of nutrition. So it's the ability to hold on to things like elements and minerals and vitamins and nitrogens and all of these pieces. It's the ability for the soil to hold on to nutrients. So sand doesn't have an ability to hold on to a lot of nutrients. Silt has a bit, clay has the best. Organic matter has the highest cation exchange capacity. When we get to surface area, and we get to water, water holds on to surface area through capillary action or capillary action. And capillary action is made up of two forces. These are mighty forces that resist gravity. One is called adhesion and the other is cohesion. Adhesion 
is the ability for water to hold on to a surface. So if we take a little science experiment here. So as water is dripping and holding onto the side of my Nalgene bottle, bottle, that is adhesion. As the water creates little droplets, that's cohesion. And as the water is together in adhesion and cohesion, that's capillary action. And that's why when you water, you'll have a three-dimensional wetting zone to the point to where when you make a swale, that wetting zone will actually move up. It will resist gravity and move up. It'll move up that soil in a three-dimensional wetting pattern. Clay can hold onto a lot of water to the point to where plants don't have access to that water because the platelets are so small and so tight, you can't get a little tiny rootlet inside of it. Silt more so, sand more so. Organic matter, when it's decomposed, has lots of what's called interstitial airspace, the airspace in between soil peds. Peds is the word we use for soil molecules. So if you, you know, grab a piece of, uh, if you grab soil and it's got this nice crumbly um, bread uh, or cake feeling, it has lots of good interstitial airspace and has lots of soil peds. Let's get back to cation exchange capacity. Organic matter has high high CEC. Silt and clay have higher CEC than sand. The more surface area you have, organic matter, clay, the more water holding capacity you have. So what creates organic matter? Microorganisms. Microorganisms work in your soil to mine, to eat, to create bioturbation, to build interstitial airspace and to leave behind residue that creates soil peds. Bacterias, uh, feces, and also its, its, its life body when it's eaten or killed by micro, uh, uh, microarthropods, protozoa, and nematodes is a glue. And so bacteria creates the glue of the soil and holds the microscopic soil together. My, uh, mycelium, fungi, fungi creates mycelium, which is the tiny little hyphal threads that you'll see in forest floors and actually makes up fungi itself. If you ever take a mushroom and, and rip it, you'll see these little hyphal threads that have the same thing that was underneath the ground came together to create the fruiting body of the fungi, of some of the fungi that we see. But those hyphal threads in good soil are holding together. It's kind of like the shear that's holding together all of this soil. So when we create high quality compost and then we put it through either an aerated compost extract or an aerated compost tea, which is taking that compost, putting it into a, a permeable bag, but stiff. So that way we don't use stockings. We don't use things, cheese cloth that could twist around and strangle and create no material. It's so compressed that the air can't actually get through it and pull out the microorganisms. We want that microorganisms into the water. And then we can use that water and we can apply it onto ground. Extracts are usually used for ground and teas are usually used for foliar or for leaf sprays. The reason for that is that the bacterial ratio in teas is higher because you usually add material to your tea so that way it brews and it usually brews longer. It usually brews somewhere between like eight, 10, 12, 24 hours. Now you can imagine if terrestrial organisms are inside a water substrate, terrestrial, land, aquatic, water, and in water, they're not used to it. The longer you brew this tea, the higher populations you'll have for some because you'll feed them with things like fish emulsate and sometimes sugar, but very, very rarely these days do we advise that anymore because most soils are too bacterially dominated because they're closer to their successional level. And succession is basically wiping out disturbance and going back to uh, bacterially dominated soil because as you move throughout succession, you move through a fungally dominated biome because forests are fungally dominated because fungi eat wood. And this happened because years ago, back when the earth was young, there was a massive level extinction event and fungi who at that point weren't accustomed to eating wood had to learn how to become saprophytic, which is the ability for a fungi to decompose dead material. And the old joke between mycophiles, which I am one, that's a lover of fungi, um, 
I have this wonderful pennant that says fungi for the win. I don't have any sports teams around me in my, in my office, but I do have a pennant that says fungi for the win. Um, is we would be kilometers deep in detritus, if not for fungi and the other detrivores, those that eat decomposing material. And so when we have fungi, it decomposes. So when we're introducing compost extract or compost tea, and they're different, to the soil, we're introducing, uh, uh, we're introducing uh, microorganisms. We're basically becoming microorganisms herders or farmers. This is kind of the joke we have. And as we introduce that, they are populating our soils and they are breaking down materials. They're building more organic matter. They're creating more bioturbation bioturb and they're increasing the cation exchange capacity, the CEC, and the water holding capacity, the WHC. Zach, does that answer your question? I got to pop up the chat. Yes. Awesome. Additional questions that have come up because of that answer. Questions, comments, queries, quotations, other quests. I have one. Yeah, go for it. So um, in this example where you were drawing out the numbers for if, if it was a filing cabinet, sand would be 10 and um, silt and clay have increasingly higher numbers. And then you said organic matter is higher than that. So like in scale, what are we looking at for organic matters number? Yeah. So this, this brings up a great question and thanks so much for, for bringing it up. Um, it will change because of the organic matter that was used to create the organic matter. So we use OM pretty generously. Like it's like saying books, right? right. It's, those are books, yet you can pull out a book, it has a whole tube of information. So what's making that organic matter will change what the um, surface area is. But on average, it's gonna be a 10X. So, oh, okay. you know, if, if, if sand is, or pardon me, if clay is 8,000, you'd be looking at 80,000 in terms of its total surface area. And when you go to things like biochar, which is taking um, carbon-based material like woody debris and things of that nature, and burning it with low oxygen. So that way what happens is all the gas, because that's what burns when anything burns is the gas that's coming off of the material. It's not the material itself. When you lose, when you, when you burn something in low oxygen, when that gas comes off, it leaves a lot of interstitial space. And so if you want a fun, uh, a fun uh, exercise, take a look for uh, biochar under microscope. Because what, what happens is you get what's called recalcitrant carbon. It's crystalline carbon and it's stable in the soil. And this is what the Amazon basin peoples of millennia figured out called terra preta, which is when you're in the tropics, this is an interesting piece about the tropics versus, um, and I think Nelson's here, so this is a good piece for him. When you're in the tropics, most of the nutrition is in the air because it's in the vegetation. When you're in temperate climates, most of the nutrition is in the soil. And for those of us that think, oh, I don't have great soil, try growing in the tropics. Like once things get going, they get going really quickly, but most of that nutrition comes out of the soil and goes directly into the air in terms of the plants and all the rest of it. So when we have things like an entire peoples who created biochar, put it into the ground, it should make us all wake up and go, oh, wait a second. And that level of water holding capacity, the surface area of biochar is again, an order of magnitude higher than organic matter. And I'm gonna do a bit of research to actually find the numbers because the geeky side of me is really interested to find what those numbers might be. And if, if data has been done on it, I know that I read something years ago that it was about 10 X, but that was a long time ago. And I imagine there's better data now, but that's generally that order of magnitude. And that's one of the reasons why we use biochar if we're trying to increase water holding capacity or increase the ability for microorganisms to find a home. Think of biochar as like Soviet style apartment blocks. It's incredible how many people you can fit in there. And that's really what biochar can be is it can be, um, uh, it can be an amazing amount of material, um, amazing amount of housing for these types of microorganisms. And that's why we talk about inoculated biochar. Biochar by itself is great, but you want to inoculate it. You want to inoculate it with compost extract, compost tea, aerated compost extract, aerated compost tea. Sometimes you want to inoculate it with urine because urine can 
uh, uric acid can hold on to the biochar and can become a, a, a fertilizer, a, a nutrient for plants in the ground. Uh, so all of that comes into how do we increase cation ion exchange capacity? And, and that can be a really important piece of doing that. Does that answer your question there, Cara? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. Sweet. Uh, Saran, when you're making swales, should you use clay as the base? Yeah, good question. So if you have a highly clay soil, highly clay soil, we're talking like 40%. And if you wanna figure out what percentage of, of clay you have, move forward to the soil assignment and use the soil by texture. The soil by shake jar test is okay. And it's a nice way to get a visual and start to see that there are, like to prove to yourself, there actually are three, three components of texture. The problem with the shake jar test is multi, multi-fold. Fold. First, clay can take up to 30 days to settle out, sometimes a year to settle out from your sample. And so when you are settling it for a week between assignments and you're like, oh, it has this percentage, it's like, mm, that's a good first idea of it, but it'll take time. Two, your metrics are changed due to the shape, specifically the bottom of your jar. If your bottom of your jar has a sharp edge, kind of like the Adam's apple or Adam's apple, uh, Adam's peanut butter jars, um, then it's better, there's less error. But if you have a rounded bottom of your jar, like you do with mason jars, there's an error there. That means that the sand that usually settles to the bottom isn't being accurately measured as the other ones are because you don't have the same columnar profile of it. Uh, secondarily, the way you shake it, the amount of soap you put into it and how you put it down, it's amazing how many folks will send me photos of this and all of their soil strata are like this. And so I know they shook it and they gently, like they, they didn't put it down really definitively. And so now everything's skewed because it's on an angle. So there's lots of issues with the shake jar test. Not to mention if you're in the field, especially if you're working remotely and especially if you're working in remote areas, which is usually what needs all of this work more so, there's no jars. You can't find a jar. There's no glass jar just lying around. Most individuals will use what's called the test by feel. And I would highly recommend practicing, practicing this. It will not feel natural the first time or the sixth time, but eventually you will get a feel for what it feels like, the granularity of it. Is it smooth? Is it silky? And then the ribbon test, how long that ribbon is. And that gives you a good sense of how much clay you have. So that gives you some background to understand what I'm about to say, uh, Saron, which is, um, if you had a 30 or 40% clay level, you have not created a swale, you've created a very long, thin pond. The reason for this is that that water will generally not absorb into the soil. So you have to think, does my soil have the ability to accept water? And if it's a high clay, clay base, it probably doesn't. And now we're looking at different tools and techniques, and all the rest of it, but we need that first metric. Does it have like a 30, 40% clay? If it's at a 20 or a 15 or whatever, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You can make it out of your clay dominant soil. Um, but if it is clay, because that was your question, should you use clay as the base? No, the point of a swale is for infiltration. So if you have a high water table, and I think we have in this class or the previous class, we have somebody with a uh, karst landscape, which is um, big holes in the landscape. Um, Infiltrating water is not as desirable because all we're doing is just putting that directly into um, those karsts. So instead, what we want to do is increase the water holding capacity of the soil, which is usually, usually done through cover crops, through mulching, through lasagna gardening, through um, grazing, through hygge culture, through um, aerated compost extracts and teas, um, or th for, through using um, manures. Um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things that there's no such thing as a vegetarian or a vegan ecology on the planet when we get outside of human um, culture. And so working with those types of interactions becomes really important in understanding how they work. And Saron, yeah, you know, Rick, Rick, Rick Ketcherson is a great colleague and friend. Also, there's the Good Earth Biochar Company, which is a friend of mine, Ron Barazan at a Powell River in British Columbia. And then another colleague of mine created a great book about biochar called um, Biochar the Solution, uh, and that's Albert Bates. So if anybody's looking for that book, that's a good one as well. Great questions, everyone. This was a fun. Oh, and again, we're like an hour and 15 in. <laughs>
cool. Oh, you're most welcome. Thanks so much for the thanks. I appreciate that. So that's it for questions. I'm going to take a quick moment and just do a little bit of a up and coming um, for the next assignment, hopefully giving you a leg up on what's coming. Just need to pull this up. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much, folks. Yeah, happy to help. Anything under the sun, that's the nice thing about these office hours. It's one of the things I really like about this, um, this version of the course is we get to do a lot of conversations. Okay, so we're just stepping into, if, if memory serves, we're just stepping into week three or week four. You're gonna have to help me out. I've got multiple courses <laughs> running of this. Are we just getting into client survey? Yeah, okay, cool. So we passed client survey and we're into site and regional challenges, right? Gonna have to help now. Yes, okay, cool, awesome. Okay, so site and regional challenges. Um, basically, we're trying to get you to understand your site in the regional context and the site context. So sometimes there's site challenges and sometimes there's regional challenges and sometimes we can address them from the site and sometimes we can't, that's life but we need to understand what the big context is. And I do this on all of, my, all, of my, all of my projects. So what are the site challenges? What are the problems or the weaknesses? What are specific things about the site that you're, you, you've now started to identify? Sometimes low, low soil nutrition. What are some of the obstacles to resolving those problems? So sometimes it's, I don't know how to build soil. Sometimes it's um, the clients don't have a clear vision of what they want. Sometimes it's the clients don't wanna do any maintenance. Sometimes that's a challenge and that becomes the constraint which builds our design. Constraints are beautiful. They're wonderful things. They tell us what we are doing and what we aren't doing. They give us the boundaries of how to play within a design. So love your constraints, find them and go, I'm so grateful I've got them. Really start to bend your mind around, I'm excited for problems because they help us to um, define it. And that's hard because most of us have been raised to bemoan problems. What's the cost due to unresolved problems and weaknesses? Now, I ask this of all my clients because I want to know if, what, their, what their motivation is to solve these things. So if the cost to resolve the problem is the house is being undermined by water and we're going to lose a half a million dollar asset, okay, now I know there's motivation to solve the problem. Cultural and social economic challenges. So what are some of the bigger conversations that are happening around us? And sometimes there is you know, specific and violent cases of hate crimes and racism. Okay, that's something you may have to deal with in the context of your design. And this really makes me think back to some of the development of things like permablitzes, which is lightning fast permaculture implementations created by Dan Palmer and his partner Adam of Very, uh, Very Edible Gardens Veg. One of the ways of building bridges across a, a interracial community was to create these permablitzes where people would come together and build a garden for the Portuguese grandma in the area in one day. So they would descend upon a site, completely transform it and walk away. So when you find these problems, you can start to find solutions for them as well. What are some of the strengths and opportunities of the region? So what's brilliant about this region? What is it producing? What is it about? What is amazing about it? And then finally, what are the most likely natural disasters? I have a hard time with um, this word, but I was overruled in the course. Uh, to nature, there's no such thing as natural disasters, just cycles. Uh, this is very much a human-made word. Um, anyways, I'll leave that there. I could diatribe on that for far too long, so I'll leave it. And then hey, what Jonathan, are some- Go ahead. Um, I don't, uh, this is great, but we're actually one lesson ahead of this. Oh, we are? Oh. Yes, we're right. on the microclimates and zones. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will wipe the egg off my face and take my foot out of my mouth. Thank you. Um, perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. So that's for uh, anybody who wants to redo those assignments. Uh, microclimate. So let's talk about microclimate. So basically any portion of your site that is on your site that you're including in your design site must have a microclimate. 
if you leave me with things that are open, open spaces, you will be not receiving full marks and you'll have to go back and do it. So don't do that. It's not necessary. You can conceive of the microclimates yourself from memories or being on site and going, yeah, okay, that was generally wet and warm and all the rest of it. Basically, we want three elements. We want solar access, how much moisture, and heat. So I want to know those three things for each of these areas. Is it sunny? Is it not sunny? Is it shady? Is it partially shady? Is it hot? Is it medium? Is it cool? And is it wet, semi-wet, super wet? We want to know what these, these three areas are. And the reason for that is when you start to lay over all these overlays, you end up with a very interesting thematic design that shows you, okay, it's hot. It's a zone two. It's generally quite accessible. Okay, hot zone two. Great. This is my major garden site. Okay, now we're getting outside of that. It's into a zone three. It's still hot. Okay, this might be my perennials. This might be my food forest, my berries. Okay, interesting. This is super shady. If I want to grow mushrooms, this may be the place that I do it. Oh, this is super sunny and very close to the house. Why well, no compost needs heat, but it doesn't need all sun. So is there a partially shaded area that still gets warmth? Okay, yeah, there is one. Okay, that might be where my compost goes. So layering these is really important. And as you get into the plant ID, and we only ask you for five, if you want to do more, you can. These colors are you representing where these plants live. If you can't find a plant for every single microclimate, no worries try to do that and that's okay and that's fine and again as Cara was talking about if your site's under um uh snow this will be a lot of guessing oh i'm pretty sure there's a plant like that there but definitely take an, an attempt at it and if you're like listen i only know of two plants that are here and the rest i don't just make a note of it that way i can go okay that's fine i can still give you the marks because i know you're considering it remember if you don't do something for me that's just okay they haven't done it and so i have to act accordingly. This is a great opportunity to really think about the microclimates. What's the, the sun, the moisture, the temperature are like, the wind like, is this a super cool? Is this a wind channel? Uh, in the other class, the places in Chicago and the two houses create a wind tunnel that has um, basically been taking out plants in a row. And so we're developing a really interesting micro windbreak for an urban context that probably has a higher wind dynamic than anything you'd see on a uh, rural context. Any questions about microclimates before I move on? I'll keep the chat up here. Uh, quick question about moisture. I have high groundwater because we are in a river valley, but the air is dry. Which should I use? Both, just let me know which is which. So if it's, yeah, a high water table for the whole thing, then just let me know that. Um, Suzanne, can I put in plants I plan to put in the microclimate? No. This is existing. The whole point is to go, what grows here? So we're still in, you, you're going to have to keep resisting the desire to design. You are not in design yet. You are in assertion. You are in long, thoughtful, and protracted observation. So no plants that you're thinking you should go there. This is us just opening up the book of nature and going, what am I reading here? We're not wanting to design yet. Great question. Undergrowth is still unknown. Okay, trees and kudzu. Yep, great. Awesome, and a thanks from Crystal. Okay, awesome. All right, uh, zones. So zones is a way of mapping your site to understand the center of human initiative, which is zone one. And sometimes we'll use zone zero because zone zero is the house or where somebody comes to the place. What if I don't have a house? Okay, use the center of human initiative. Wherever you enter into and start a site, wherever the tools are kept or where people come into it or might be sitting or connecting with that zone one. Um, and sometimes zones don't have a zone one in an existing zone. Sometimes the whole site is a zone three. You, you go there you know, every couple of weeks. Sometimes it's a zone four. You go there every couple of months or once a year. And sometimes it's a zone five. You haven't been there. It's gone totally wild and it's a total zone five. Let me repeat this. You do not need every single zone in the current zones because this is an assertion. This is an assay. You're seeing what is. How do you designate what zones are what? You go through pathways and traffic and circulatory systems. So it's important to take footpaths first and foremost. Make sure you know when and where those footpaths are trotted, including the car paths, and gives you a good sense. You do not have to fit everything into this little tiny box, as you'll see over here. Some folks have done quite 
quite bigger and, and, and um, more robust. This is just a suggestion, an easy way to begin. Um, you can use a horizontal legend. You can use a vertical legend if you want to bring in your horizontal title bar. Remember, I'm a big fan of horizontal title bars because very few people are actually benefiting from the vertical title bars. That's fine. Make sure every single area, just like microclimates, has a zone. Now, remember, sometimes your pathways are the ones that are, are, are trafficked more. So the pathways become the zone one, including areas. Notice how in this, we have a lot of pathways that are zone one and pathways that are zone two. Similarly, uh, this was in France, um, we had a zone one, and then we had a zone two, and then we had a zone five, right? So quite different. Um, I do not recommend changing the color scheme here for your zones, only because this really does give you a heat map. And again, blue is for water, green is for vegetation. Do not give me any green or blues in your zones. Every once in a while, if there's a blue for a microclimate, I'm okay with it, especially if it's wet and shady. That's fine. Don't give me microclimates of green. We're really trying to move outside of the sphere of that vegetation and, and sense, okay, what's actually here? What's actually happening? What other things do I see pro, uh, mistakes of zones? Make sure you give me an explanation what's happening in that area. And um, again, play with it, have fun with it. Uh, my site is a balcony with no natural plants. So should I put zero plants? also have a living room. Yeah, so if you don't have any plants there currently, um, that's fine. If you've ever had plants there, I would just say, okay, these are the plants that have grown there. And then generally with a balcony, um, and I am still looking for, your, for those previous balcony assignments, but you can imagine with 40 students, four to six assignments a year, uh, seven years of doing this, I'm, I'm only through the last couple of years, so I am looking for you. Um, that uh, they've done it in such a way. So there's, there's technically a place that they walk that was sort of zone one almost every day. And sometimes people do a zone for the winter and a zone for the summer, which can be very, very useful. So if you wanna do a winter and a summer zone map, and if you wanna do a winter and summer zone um, microclimate, especially for those of you that are in the tropic or the semi-tropics, feel free to, that gives you a lot of information as well. All right, folks, another hour and a half has elapsed. Any final questions, comments, queries, quotations? Happy, happy, Joy Joy. Oh. I do have a question. Go for it. So with the zoning, um, the property that I'm doing the design for is we're not there permanently. We're there maybe once or twice a year. Um, so basically, zone wise it would be really there's not really a zone one that i visit daily however um we also intend to possibly do some ecotourism style airbnb there um so people would walk certain walkways and would interact with it regularly obviously those guests however wouldn't water or i i guess the most they would do is pick some fruit of a tree so what's the type of zoning perspective i best adopt there is it really purely from my perspective, how I interact with the land is kind of a mishmash of both where I say, okay, it's maybe a, the orchard is a zone two also for the guests because they go there to pick some fruit or should I leave, leave that aspect out altogether? Great question. So this zone is existing only and existing for the people that actively are on the site. So I would say when you are on site, what is your zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, as it is today. One of the you know, there's a, there's a Cuban design I was a part of when we were down there and they had um, their zone zero, their house, and then they had their ben banana grove right beside the house. And yet it was in the best growing zone they possibly could and their vegetables were another 40 feet away. And so one of the major changes was in the existing zone map, all of these zone one things were so far away from the house but when they were taking a look at some of their zone two and zone three and zone four things, they were right up beside the house. So one of the major processes, and because bananas are a herb, they're not a tree, it's really easy to cut down the banana stalk, dig up the corn and transplant. We had an entire um, banana grove transplant. So we took all of the banana out, moved them someplace else, and then put in a massive veggie garden that had a lot of crenulations and rows and access and all the rest of that. So this is really to get a sense of that first um, 
that first existing zone. How are we treating the, the, the site today? And then how to move on from that. I'll, I'll leave you with um, a funny story. So I love uh, cob ovens. And if you don't know about clay or cob ovens, they're basically clay ovens that you build a fire within, heats up to a beautiful temperature, they bake beautifully. And basically you can cook for about 24 hours. So for those of you that like meal prepping, you can have your pizza night, then you can go into your casseroles, then you can do and in, go into your long, slow cooks and you can cook beans or other things for you know a day or two, leave it, forget it. And um, my partner uh, really wants to put the, the pizza oven, the cob oven about a good 50 feet away. And we have had arguments, regardless of the fact that I've done this for now going on a decade, regardless of the fact that I've designed multiple sites, we are still arguing to this day that the pizza oven should go about five steps out the back door. So that way your ingredients are inside and your cooking appliances are outside around where we're gonna do an outside kitchen. And we're still arguing about it to this day. And one of the things I did was I showed them the zone map, where we go and where we go in winter, which is not very far from around the house and where we go in the summer, which is far in the house. But once you get into high season, hot season, heat dome, uh, wildfire season, smoky season, we basically have smoke for like two and a half, three months of the year. Um, now you don't want to go very far from the house at all, especially if you're working with fire. So, and we come into fire bans during the season as well. So thinking about these elements as the interactions we need for them, this is why, you know, if you have chickens, having them, you know, in the back field doesn't make sense. You can't monitor them, et cetera. But if you have goats or if you have sheep or if you have cattle, you know, having them further away from the house does make sense. So the zone assessment is something that's unique to permaculture. It's one of the, the few unique things to permaculture that isn't just the, the compilation that Mollison and Holmgren did of indigenous practices and innovative practices and, and academic practices. Zones is very something unique about, you know, what's the proximity and what's the frequency and moving things that are higher frequency closer to the center of human initiative and moving things that are less frequent further away from the center of human initiative. But sometimes with little tiny um, indicators. So this is something that Ben Falk and others will do is if you have a swath of uh, a forest, a food forest, a orchard, a trellised row of raspberries, apples, etc., you'll have a single species of that within eyesight of the house. And so it becomes sort of the landscape. But when the apple's blooming, you know the orchard is blooming. When the raspberries are coming on, you know the raspberries are coming on. And so this is a really interesting opportunity for you folks to think about, if, especially if you're doing broad scale, to have little key indicator species. <laughs> so you just need two cob ovens. Kara, uh, you're, taking, you're taking their side. I do not appreciate that. Just kidding. Um, it, having key indicator species around the house is really important. So that can be an element of your design process is to have something close by. And his book, The Resilient Homestead, the something something homestead, The Resilient Homestead, his book's great. I'll put it into the um, show notes when I get to it, wherever it is. A lot of my books when I used to teach live went walking. And uh, you can only have so many books go walking before you decide never to lend them out again. So anyways, all right. 34 minutes over, folks. We're doing that long office hour again. Anyways, um, such a pleasure to see everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Again, any problems, any questions, any comments, queries, conversations, definitely do let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to chat with folks. If you do need some one-on-one -on -one help, we can do that as well. Um, not a problem in that. There's a couple of extra upcoming courses that you might be interested in that I just wanted to tell folks about. Should have done the announcement at the beginning, but got too excited and got into it. So there is an upcoming Huga culture course that's going to be happening in, uh, I think we're almost less than a month, maybe a month and a bit with Zach Weiss. So Zach is Sepp Holzer's um, pro prodigy. And I went over and worked a bit with Sepp. And together, Zach and I have laid something in the order of miles of, um, uh, miles of uh, Huga culture or kilometers of Huga culture. So that's, that's coming up and I'm ridiculously excited about that. 
Um, so I'm going to put that link into our Q and A doc. I should put it at the top. There we go. If somebody wants to put those in the chat, that'd be great. So one's the Hugo culture. And the second one is called eat well in 2022. There's an amazing permaculturalist chef, Seth Peterson, who's been a chef in uh, Portugal and um, has, has done a lot of Asian cuisine, but is a, uh, is, you know, Italian descent and has been a professional chef for years. And we were chatting this past year about one of the things that can draw people into regenerative agriculture and into regenerative living is how they cook and why they cook. And so we're offering an uh, initial introduction to the Eat Well series in 2022, and we'll be focusing on flavors first, and we'll be doing a live demonstration that folks can follow along with, with how to make a salad dressing and balance fats, vinegars, and salt. And I can tell you, Having been an officiato of food and almost going to culinary school, I can't believe I've been doing um, salad dressings wrong because we did a little demo the other day. That was amazing. Uh, the second is traditional cooking. So we'll be talking about fast cooking and slow cooking. Uh, we'll be talking about um, an Italian ragu that his Italian grandmother uh, showed him how to make. And then we'll be talking about seasonality and how to plan menus through seasonal cooking and how to menu plan for the season because it benefits that trillion member community within us so well. If it's that first one's not for you, I highly recommend you click on the interest link only to see the, I think he has 35 potential courses he wants to offer and they're pretty incredible. So there's like uh, introductory to ferments, advanced ferments, there's uh, Chinese New Year, there's uh, my Portuguese grandmother, there's my Italian grandmother, there's my Vietnamese grandmother, there's my Chinese grandmother, there's dumplings, there's uh, cooking with fire, there's full animal butchery, there's like the scope of what he wants to do in the next two years is phenomenal. So if only to increase uh, your salivation, everything is in the question and answer doc. So the eat well and the other one. And so I'll put the eat well into the chat here, eat well. So that's eat well and then the hugel. Here's the other one, and I'll make sure that it's in the show notes as well for folks. So those are coming up. And then the last one that I'll tell you about now uh, that you might be interested in is for the last decade, I have been pioneering and curating and cultivating a values-based decision-making process to help people make good decisions. And what I haven't told anybody here, because this is a permaculture course, is that I'm a regenerative land designer. And one of the tools I use is permaculture. Another one of the tools I use is something called values-based decision-making, which is understanding the values, the objectives without goals that people want of their site. And back when Jeff Lawton was really publicizing uh, Greening the Desert, and then when Biggest Little Farm came out, people would call me up and they would say, I want the permaculture farm. farm. Again, like I'm some vending machine and you press a button and out comes the farm. But when I pushed people and I said, well, what do you really want? from that farm, they would say things like, well, I wanna know where my food comes from. And I wanna know that my, my kids are being, are being raised in a clean environment and all of these things, their values, especially because their values were, I don't wanna spend a lot of time, didn't line up with owning a farm. Anybody who's farmed before knows the amount of effort, the time, if you're homesteading, you know the effort. And what's so interesting is we are, we are, we have a bit of crow to us. We, we're, we suffer from shiny thing and itis, you know, the next shiny thing, oh, I want it, I want it, I want it. And so for large scale homesteaders and farmers, I completely recommend, and I usually help them to build what's called a context, which is a values-based objective, which then uses a decision-making process to test any decision to bring about the values. It's an if-then statement. If we undertake bringing on pigs to the site, will we then have all of these beautiful values that we want to be true be true? And I can probably lay claim to fame that I've talked more people out of farming than I've talked into it, but I've put them into a place to where they've uh, worked their landscape or they've become homesteaders instead of farms, farmers, or they start to support community supported agriculture, CSA, instead of being farmers. They've worked with what they needed when they needed it. So values-based decision-making is a phenomenal tool. It is a tool that has been pivotal, if not the linchpin to my success. And for the first time in the last five years, I'm going to be offering a group course on values-based decision-making in April. Details are still coming out about that. Specifics are still coming out. And um, I was just speaking with my, uh, my apprentice. Uh, I've taken on apprentice with this work. Um, 
because he wants to to learn all of this and it's really quite exciting to have an apprentice who's interested so um we've we just uh curated the last of the information so i can i can start to share this with folks and again i'll put this in the chat here and i'll put it into the q a doc for anyone that's interested but i cannot recommend values-based decision making enough it um completely changed my life any questions about those Questions, comments, queries, quotations. So, bon. all right. Well, folks, again, such a pleasure. So excited that uh, we're moving along the course together. Um, thanks for correcting me on the assignment that I was not supposed to be telling you about because it already happened. And uh, any questions, comments, queries, feel free to reach out. You don't have to suffer alone. Do not struggle at this. If you have a question, reach out. If you need someone on one time, reach out. Again, if you're struggling with the digitization process, um, go back to drawing. Uh, I say it in the very first tutorial of the very first assignment, drawing is what I, I recommend and doing um, doing hybrid design. So, oh, thanks so much, Jacqueline. Um, there's there's definitely lots to learn and uh, happy to share. Thanks so much, uh, Saran. Thanks so much, Suzanne, a pleasure. This will be up within a couple of uh, days and uh, have a lovely week. Enjoy the course and we'll see you in the next one.